we're still in the Gospel of John. Now, John is the most uh, theological of all the four Gospels. John presents more theology in his gospel than any of the previous three. And what John is trying to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt is what? Yes, Jesus is the Christ. He is Lord. Look with me. He gives us a purpose statement there in chapter 20 of John. Look with me at chapter 20. We'll see in these two verses, 30 and 31, that it's not only apologetic and that he's presenting the argument, the defense, the proofs that Jesus is who he said he is. There's those seven I am statements that Jesus makes, right, in the Gospel of John. The tetragrammaton, the four-letter Hebrew word for God, right? Now, we have already covered five of the seven, or four of the seven. We've got a few more to go. He is the true vine. He is the resurrection and the life. But nonetheless, and then there are very seven very specific miracles that John is going to record for us to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is who he said he is, not only by the testimony of his words, not only by the testimony of John the Baptist, not only by the testimony of the scriptures, but the testimony of the very works that he has performed that it was foretold that the Messiah would be able to do and such he has done. But look at chapter 20, verse 30 for a moment. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples. But he records these specific, these seven signs or miracles, and we're going to cover the last one now. Well, some could uh, assume that after his resurrection, the multiplication of the fish on the Sea of the Galilee was a miracle nonetheless. But this would be the, the seventh of the seven miracles in the raising of Lazarus as we get into chapter 11. So it is apologetic, but look at verse 31. But these things, these were written that you may believe. It's evangelistic as well. You're going to, you're going to, it's apologetic. We want you to know in your mind, in your heart, to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing, you may receive salvation. You may have life in his name. So John's gospel was meant to be apologetic. That's why there's so much theology there in John's gospel. But it was also meant to be evangelistic. Okay, quite often we have to approach the head to get to the heart, right? And so that's what John is doing here. Now we're in this 11th chapter of John's gospel. What does the 11th chapter deal with? What was that first song, worship song you sang this morning? It don't matter. Well, that's going to be the song they're going to sing at my funeral. It don't matter where you bury me, right? Right. And so we're dealing with what in chapter 11? The raising of Lazarus from the dead. The resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. Now, I'm not going to get into chapter 11 so much this morning. I want to talk about death for a moment. Death our friend or death our foe? Hmm? Well, from a biblical perspective and from the perspective of the believer, death is not our foe. It is our friend right now. It is the only way by which we get to where we want to go at this point, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. How many resurrections are recorded for us in the Bible? Yes, there's resurrections in the Old Testament and there's resurrections in the New Testament. Does anybody have any idea? That's a good number, seven, but there are, there are three in the Old Testament, okay? One was uh, by, performed by the prophet Elijah, and last week I mentioned that he, uh, Elisha asked for a double portion of the power of the mantle of Elijah, right? So if Elijah did one, then Elisha did two. So two miracles were performed by Elisha. So there were three in the Old Testament, three resurrections. And Jesus himself performed how many in the New Testament? Three. Very good. Three. <laughs> and we're going to look at those this morning, right? Uh, the first one, he was traveling through the Galilee region, and he was in a city called Nain. You remember any of this? Okay, we're going to cover this. But there was a funeral procession that was taking place. How, how long did the Jews wait before they buried the dead? I'm sorry? Sundown. Sundown. Immediately. Immediately you had to bury the dead. And so this young man had just expired, and they were having this funeral procession, and his mother was a widow. His father had already passed, and she was grieved, and Jesus had compassion on her, touched the young man, and he rose from the dead. The second resurrection that Jesus performed was where? Was Jairus' daughter. 
Jairus' daughter in Capernaum. He was the leader of the synagogue in Capernaum, remember? Yeah. And then the third resurrection that Jesus performed is here in John 11. That's with Lazarus. Now, now Matthew records for us that the day that Jesus was crucified, when he gave up his spirit, he surrendered himself to the Lord. What had happened that day? What happened? Many of the, many of the graves of those who had deceased in Jerusalem were opened. Can you imagine that? Seeing all these people who were predeceased and walking around Jerusalem at that time. And then the apostles, Peter and Paul, also performed resurrections, didn't they? Do you remember those at all? Yep. yep. Yeah, Eutychus. Eutychus, Paul was preaching. He's like me. He preaches a long time. You know, when I come on Sunday morning, my gun is full. You know, it's loaded. And I'm, I could preach all afternoon, you know. And so Paul, he was preaching well into the evening. And poor Eutychus, he was trying to pay attention. And he fell out the window and he died. And Paul went down and said, don't worry, he's not dead. And Paul raised him from the dead. And then there was a fashion show at Joppa. You remember that? No? There was a fashion show. All of the women of Joppa were showing Peter all of the wonderful garments that Dorcas or Tabitha had made for them. You know, she was a seamstress and they're having a fashion show. And then Peter had such compassion, he raised her from the dead. Wow. But the greatest resurrection in the Bible is whose? Jesus. Jesus, yeah. Yeah, so there's no less than 10 resurrections as we look at the scriptures. So I thought we would do that to see the purpose of it. But first of all, I want to talk about the subject of death. So go with me to Genesis chapter 2, where we see the birth of death, right? Was God, let me put it this way, is death a natural part of life? Is death a natural part of life? Yes. Was not originally. It was never God's intention that death become a part of life, a natural part of life. It happened as a result of our first parents' disobedience. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. Verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for the day you eat thereof you shall surely die. Is that what happened? Why was God trying to keep us from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil? Because we can't process it as evil. Process what? Evil. Evil. We, we cannot attain the knowledge of evil without having it corrupt us, without doing the same. We try to keep our children as innocent as possible for as long as possible from the evil that's out there, don't we? Paul writes and says that we should be mature when it comes to good, but immature, naive when it comes to evil, right? And so God was just trying to keep us from the knowledge of evil because it does corrupt, doesn't it? But we see what happened the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die, right? And so once that took place, look at chapter 3 of Genesis. God had to do something there in verse 22. And then God said, behold, the man has become like us, like one of us, meaning he has attained the knowledge of evil, to know good and evil. And now, least he put out his hand and also eat of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. And so he drove out the man and placed cherubim at the east of the end of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. What's that all about? God, God told him in the very beginning, you can eat of all the trees in the garden, just don't eat the tree of good and evil. Now he's preventing him from eating from the tree of life. Doesn't want them to live forever in that sinful state, in that fallen state. Isn't God merciful? Isn't he gracious? Now, I did a teaching once before, and that's what this cross represents here, is that the tree of life represented in the garden of Eden is truly what? It's type, symbol, and sign of what? The tree of life, the tree of life is sign and symbol and type of what? The cross. Listen, the cross of Jesus Christ is the tree of life. Do you understand? What the tree of life represented in the Old Testament is fulfilled in essence. 
than reality in the cross of Christ. I taught you that before, haven't I? No? <laughs> so, remembrance is a good thing, right? So that's why I remind you of these things, right? All right, so the tree of life, they were prevented from eating of the tree of life because God did not want them to live in that state eternally in the state of sin. Now, the first death, when did that occur? I'm sorry? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. I only have one son. How many of you have multiple children? Do you have two boys? Three boys. Three boys. My three sons. Yeah. <laughs> What a grief it would be to your heart if one of your boys murdered the other. You would know what the sting of death really is, wouldn't you? Yeah. And m most of us, if we're here any length of time at all, you're going to experience the pain of the sting of death, don't we? Don't we? God never intended that to be, ever. That's a result of man's willful disobedience to God. Every funeral I ever preach, I always mention the fact that I'm doing this because it validates the, word, the truthfulness of the word of God. In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And the sting of death, although the pain and the suffering is temporary, for those of us who have experienced it in this life, it is lifelong. We cope with a new reality. We cope with the loss but the sting, although the initial pain of it all has subsided to some degree, there's still the residue of pain of that sting, isn't there? Can anybody bear witness to that? Yeah. It's very painful to lose someone you love. But we look and we say, okay, so why? Why the purpose of the resurrections in the Bible? Let's look at them. And we'll do this quickly. Uh, go with me to 1 Kings chapter 17. This will be the first resurrection in the scriptures performed by the prophet Elijah, by the power of God. Everyone there? Yep. Verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, to Elijah, saying, Go arise to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Where was Zarephath? Just south of Sidon, just north of Tyre. Gentile or Jew? Gentile. Now, the first, first resurrection that's performed is on behalf of a Gentile woman. Isn't that amazing? Hmm? God, listen, God never chose to exclusively bless just the Jewish people. He simply chose them to represent his love, his grace, his truth to the world. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. But here, here, the first resurrection is going to be on behalf of this Gentile woman, a Sidonian. So it says here that this woman would provide for him. And so he arose and he went to Zarephath and he came to the gate of the city. Indeed, there was a widow there gathering sticks. And he called her and said, please bring me a little cup of water in a cup that I may drink. Verse 11, and as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And so she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, a little bit of oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and for my son that we may eat and die. This is all, listen, this is all she has left. I, 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 don't, I don't know what I... I'm 70 years old. I have never experienced a single day where I have been deprived of food. Have any of you? Anybody? No. We're so fortunate. We're so blessed. Now, unfortunately, that's not true of a lot of people in the world today. And, and we know that one of the marks of the end time, and I believe we're in the end times, is that there's going to be a significant increase in what? Famines. Famines. There's going to be a significant correction and reset in our economy next year. Just be prepared emotionally and spiritually for what the Lord is going to allow or what the Lord is going to bring about in this nation that's in rejection of him. But this woman, she, she had resigned herself to the fact that once she makes this little cake and divides it between her and her son, they're going to starve to death. They're going to die. That's not God's plan, though, is it? 
And God always takes care of his church, always. And I'm not talking about Christian dumb. I'm talking about the body of Christ. He always takes care of the body of Christ, doesn't he? Yeah. It goes on to say, And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as I have said, and, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. Afterward, make some for yourself and for your son. Now, do you know the rest of the story that the, the bin of flour never was extinguished. The jar of oil was never depleted. She had a continual supply until food came back into the area. And she could take care of herself. But God provided miraculously. Now it happened over the course of time. Now it happened, verse 17, after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And this sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, what have I done with you, O man of God? Have you come to bring my son to remembrance and to kill my son? Bring my sin to remembrance? So she's blaming God and blaming the prophet for the death of her son. Now, a lot of people do that sometimes when they experience the sting of death. God understands. He knows our frame. He knows our emotions. And he's, he knows that sometimes our emotions take us places we shouldn't go. You know. One of the steps of grief when you experience the sting of death is anger. Mm -hmm. And when you process the consequence, the situation, the circumstance, you have to ask yourself, why would a sovereign God allow this pain to come into my life? And so who do you end up blaming? You blame God. But you don't really mean that. Mm -hmm. It's your pain speaking. It's your emotion. And so too with this woman. But eventually you come to that place where you realize that, that, that so often it's a merciful thing yeah. when God allows that to take place, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So she's blaming the prophet, blaming God, and saying this is a result of her sin. And he said to her, verse 19, give me your son. And so he carried him out in her arm. He carried him out in, of her arms, carried him to the upper room, where he was staying and laid him on the bed. And then he cried to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? Now, please don't misunderstand. Elijah is not accusing God. He's just saying, God, why have you allowed this to take place? You know, the first thing I said when, when I saw the building and we got on the prayer line this morning at seven was I had to laugh. And say, God, what are you doing in all of this? What is this all about? All things, all things, what? Is it true? Yes. All things. And my prayer is that it'll work to the salvation of this young woman. Who knows but God? But there's a good purpose in it all. And we have, you know, it, it, nobody got hurt. It's not fatal. It's only going to cost us time and money. Right? So you got to keep your perspective. And so Elijah did as well. But he's just wanting to try to understand this. Verse 21, he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, my God, I pray, let this soul come back to him. And then the Lord heard the voice of, voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him and he revived and Elijah took the child and brought him down in the upper, from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. Wow. And then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of God, the word of the Lord in your mouth is in fact true. This was to validate the truth claims that Elijah was making about God, that God is the one who is in control. He's the Lord of heaven and earth. He's in control of life and death. Those of you who raised your hand and you experienced the sting of death, what... What a shocking, marvelous, wonderful thing it would be if they walked through that door right now, wouldn't it? What? Oh, one day. Not for them, but for us. But one, one day, one, one day we're going to experience the, the, the reuniting of those who have, we've lost through death, who still believe in the Lord. Amen? Yeah. Death doesn't cause us to cease to exist. We are made in the image of God, and therefore we are made spirit. The true me is spiritual. I inhabit this body temporarily. Looking forward to the day when I get out of here, I suffer from POD. You know what that is? At 70 years old, it's the pain of the day. You know, as you get older, you wake up and you have a different pain somewhere every single day. Is that, amen? Yeah, yeah. And so one day this body will be healed perfectly. Oh, my. 
But here the woman, the woman was made assured that all that Elijah had said declaring the truth of his God was true. And so salvation came to the heart of this Gentile woman. Now go to 2 Kings chapter 4. The disciple of Elijah was Elisha. And Elisha asked for a double portion of the, the miracle power of Elijah, and he got that. He did twice the miracles that did Elijah. As a matter of fact, he was responsible for two resurrections, the first one here in chapter 4. I referenced this story last week in my message of the Shunammite woman from Shunam, right? <clears throat> in the tribe of uh, Issachar in uh, Israel. In that territory. So this is a, an Israeli, a Jewish woman. And so she built a upper chamber, a room for the prophet when he would come through the area. Uh, her and her husband were very gracious to him. And she's the woman that uh, Elijah said, well, find out what the woman is in need of. She's been so kind to us. And uh, the gaze, I came back and said, she's never had a son. And so Elisha had prophesied that a year from now, you will be nursing your son. And so it was. She, was, she became pregnant, and she gave birth to a boy. And so after he was weaned, he was working with his father and the men of the village uh, and working out in the field, and he ended up having an excruciating headache, and he passed out. And the father told the servants to carry him to his mother. And she laid him on her lap, and she cared for him until he passed. He died in her lap. Can you imagine such a thing? Mom? No, no. But then she laid him on the prophet's bed. And she had her servant saddle the donkey, and she made haste to go and see the prophet Elisha. But as she's making her way, the prophet sees her coming from afar off, and what does he say to Gehazi? I don't know why she's here. The Lord hasn't told me. Now, I'm always amazed when the Lord tells me something supernaturally. We call it epinosis, right? Knowledge from above, right? Elisha was surprised when God didn't tell him. That's the connection he had. Isn't that wonderful? Boy, wouldn't you like to have that kind of a communion, a connection with the Lord? And, and so he sends Gehazi out to talk to the woman. Let's pick it up at uh, verse 25. And so she departed and she went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. This is chapter 4, verse 25 of 2 Kings. Everybody there? Okay. And so it was when the man of God saw her afar off, and he said to his servant Gehazi, look, the Shunammite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? And she answered, it is well. Now, remember why I brought about the fact of the story? Because we sang the hymn, it is well. It is well with my soul. Remember Horatio Spafford, who was the song leader for Moody? He lost his daughters at sea. And when he came to that place as he was traveling to England to meet his grieving wife, to that very place where that sea, the, the ship had sunk in the sea, he penned this song. Now, I don't know because we don't have a record of it, but my personal conjecture is, my personal belief is, this is the inspiration of the song. So when I see Horatio, I'm going to ask him. It is well. Now she came to the man of God at the hill. She caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God said, let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress, the sting of death. It's horrible, isn't it? We grieve. 15 years ago, I lost my first wife of 37 years. 15 years ago, Gail lost her husband. 20 years. To this very day, it stings. There are times when grief will come upon her, and I completely understand. And there are times where grief will come upon me that sting. It's been 15 years. I can't look at photo albums. It's, it's, it's too painful. But I look forward to a reunion. Leave her alone. Her soul is in deep distress. And the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. <laughs> so she said, did I not, did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Because when he foretold that she was going to have a son, she didn't believe him. But it happened just as the prophet had declared. And the mother of the child, verse 30, said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. 
So he arose and he followed her. Now Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid his staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Therefore he went back to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awakened. And Elisha came into the house where the child was lying down in his bed, and he went up therefore and shut the door behind the two of them. And he prayed to the Lord, and he went up and he laid it up on the child and he put his mouth upon his mouth his eyes upon his eyes his hands upon his hands and he stretched himself out on the child and the flesh of the child became warm and he returned and he walked back and forth in the house and again he went up and stretched himself on him and then the child sneezed seven times and he opened his eyes and he called Gehazi and said call the Shunammite woman and so he called her and when she came in to him he said pick up your son And so she went and fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. And she picked up her son and went out. The sting of death was lifted. She saw the glory and the power of God. And that's precisely what what Jesus is going to tell his disciples when they indicate to him that John is ill. And he said, I'm glad for your sakes we're not there, but that for the glory of God, the sickness has come. God's glory was shown and his power over death and the promise of everlasting life by believing in God is validated here. Now, the next time it takes place in the life of Elijah, Elijah's dead. <laughs> Look with me for a moment at uh, 2 Kings 13. Now, this man has, has died, and they're burying him, and as they're trying to prepare the burial, they're at the same uh, cemetery or burial ground where Elisha the prophet was buried. And the Moabites began to raid the northern, this is in the northern kingdom of Israel, and the Moabites uh, historically would raid the northern kingdom during the harvest season. They would allow the Jews to work the land, to toil the land, to do everything they could. And then once the produce was ready for harvest, then they'd come in and they'd raid the land and steal the harvest. So the Moabites are coming in to raid the land. And as the raiders are coming in, the burial uh, uh, process that's taking place, they have to do it in haste. And so they take this man and they throw him in the tomb of Elisha. Look what takes place. Chapter 13, verse 20. Then Elisha died and was buried, and they buried him. And the raiding bands from Moab invaded the land in the spring of the year. And so it was, as they were burying a man, they suddenly, they spied a band of raiders. And they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the man was laid down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. Wow. (laughs) Now, should, uh, should we be consulting the dead? Should we be looking for any sign of of, uh, any contact or transmission of power from the dead? No. No. Uh, Do you know about the uh, Orthodox Jews? There's a couple different branches of of rabbinical Judaism. There are those who are biblical rabbinical Judaism who follow the Old Testament scriptures precisely. And then there are those who are more uh, mystics, who are following the traditions, uh, rabbinical traditions, rather than the Bible itself. So where the rabbinical tradition parts from the scriptures, they follow the tradition of the the rabbis. Every year, there is a place in Israel where literally uh, last year was a million Orthodox Jews, Jewish men, congregated this place because they revere this particular rabbi who had passed away. And they believe by starting these bomb fires and giving reverence to this dead rab- uh, rabbi and, and making contact with his tomb, that they receive power. Good or bad? Bad. Is there a prohibition against this sort of thing? Consulting the dead? Where? Right, Saul, Saul did it anyway, but, but it, the direct prohibition is in Deuteronomy chapter 18. You should never consult the dead. No. And as a matter of fact, you know what happened with this gathering this past year? A million Orthodox Jews? What happened? People died. There was a narrow area where it kind of narrowed down where they could make their exit. And for some reason, they were making an exit in haste. Fifty-five people were trampled to death. Hmm. Terrible, terrible. Not the Lord. 
So, but some people use justification for seeking the dead or seeking power from the tomb of the dead in this text. No, 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 no. This is just a miracle God had performed to show his power over death, and he rose this man for a specific reason. Now, those are the three in the Old Testament. We said there were three in the New Testament. And the first three were all performed by Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Who was the first one? The widow's son from Nain. Turn with me to Luke. Let's look at uh, Luke chapter 7. There's a purpose for I'm showing you all of this. There's a purpose for us going through these resurrections to strengthen and encourage your faith that I am far, far more than my body. And my life is far more than just my existence here, isn't it? My true existence will be after I pass from this life to the next. When I exhale here for the last time, not when I breathe my last breath, because you don't breathe your last breath here. You exhale, right? When the body expires, you... It's over. Then you inhale heaven's air. Then, then you experience life in all of its fullness. Yes, praise God indeed. Jairus' daughter. Now, he was the leader of this, uh, excuse me, I'm not there yet. The son of uh, the widow and the widow at Nain. We are in Luke chapter 7, right? Let's pick it up in verse 11. Uh, you know the three regions in Israel during the time of Jesus? You had the northern region where the Sea of the Galilee was. They called that the region of the Galilee region. Right, right, right. Now, the southern region, region where Jerusalem was, where the Dead Sea area is, they called that Judea. That's right. And sandwiched between Judea and the Galilee? Samaria. Samaria. They wouldn't go through the land of the Samaritans, right? Right, right. But this particular funeral was taking place there in the Galilee region in one of the cities of the Galilee region called Nain. Now it happened the day after that he went into the city of Nain and many of his disciples went with him in a large crowd. This is Jesus now. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. Boy, I can't imagine what it would be like lose your husband and lose your son. My first wife's mother, my mother-in-law, she's still alive. She's in her 90s, and she's well taken care of by my son. He loves his grandmother dearly. But she lost her husband. She lost her two daughters. She lost her son, you know. Yet she is such a joyous woman, isn't she? You know where that joy comes from? She reads her scriptures every day, every day. She finds her joy in her relationship with the Lord. And she concentrates on her gain, not her loss. So should we, right? This widow, she lost her husband, now she's lost her son. And a large crowd from the city was with her. Verse 13, then the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said to her, weep, now do not weep. And then he came and he touched the open coffin. And those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And so he who was dead sat up and began to speak and presented him to his mother. And then fear came upon all and they glorified God saying, a great prophet has risen up among us and God has visited his people and this report about him went throughout all of Judea and all of the surrounding regions, north to south. This happened in the Galilee region, but all the way down in the south, everyone heard about this resurrection of this boy from Nain. Validating the truth claims that God has made that he is the Lord of heaven and earth. He is the king of life and death. Hmm? Now the next miracle that Jesus performed was with Jairus' daughter, the leader of the synagogue in Capernaum. So turn with me there, and we'll find that in Luke 8. Uh, for time's sake, I'm going to cut out some of the things I wanted to share. Verse 40, let's go there. Verse 40, and so it was when Jesus returned with that, the multitude welcomed him. 
And they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came to him a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet, and he begged him to come into the house. And he had, only, he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Now let's pick it up in verse uh, 49. While he was still speaking, someone caused the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. That's devastating news, isn't it? Yeah. By the way, did anybody see the Realm post on Kevin Foote? Some of you, uh, if you've been here any length of time, you probably know Kevin. He's a friend of this ministry, sweet young man. He's uh, in the hospital. He may have colon cancer, but they're not sure. They're still doing tests, but he asked for prayer. And so we put him on the prayer line, and he wanted to thank everybody for their prayers. And so, Kevin, we just want to shout out to you and let you know we are praying, and we're going to pray you through this. I don't believe that this is unto death. I believe that God has brought this sickness for his glory. So they came to the ruler of the synagogue and they told him, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. Verse 50. But when Jesus heard it, he answered and said, do not be afraid. Only believe and she will be made well. What's John emphasizing in his gospel? That we must believe that Jesus is the Christ. And in believing, you'll receive that truth within your heart. You'll pray that God saves you, saves your soul. And once you surrender your heart and your life to Christ and acknowledging who he is, salvation, eternal life. The sting, the threat, the fear of death is gone. Praise God. Do not fear only believe, and she will be made well. Verse 51, when he came into the house, he permitted no one except for Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. Now you remember who the physician was that was attending this girl? It's not recorded here. But whose gospel is this? So who was the attending physician? Who came to salvation that day? Luke. Luke. (laughs) And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. Verse 54. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called her, saying, Little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately and commanded that, they sh- that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Now, you've got to know that everybody told everyone what had happened. But they had to be out of their mind with joy, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. What a glorious thing. Now, the third resurrection we're not going to go into this morning because I'm going to, it'll be a few weeks as we're in chapter 11 of John's gospel, and that'll be the raising of Lazarus from the dead. But there are a few more resurrections. Go with me to Matthew's gospel, chapter 27. Chapter 27, we have the record of Jesus' death upon the cross. Verse 45, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting what psalm? 22. 22, the psalm of the cross. We went through that. And some of those who heard them said, this man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put a reed on it and offered it to him to drink. And the rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. No one takes my life, he said, right? I lay it down. No one could kill Jesus. You can't kill God. And then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Why was that such a miracle? I'm sorry? 
How thick was it? No, no, no. How thick was the curtain? Yeah, it was about a six inch. You, you couldn't, a team of horses couldn't tear that curtain, but it was torn from the top down. What does that indicate? God opened up the veil. And the veil was torn from top to bottom. Just a side note. And, and the earth quaked, and the rocks split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So here you had these deceased individuals there in Jerusalem whose bodies were raised from the dead, walking around Jerusalem for at least four days. Because they, they were even walking around Jerusalem after his resurrection. This is the day of his death. What an amazing testimony that would be. And is it grand that through the resurrection of those many that all of Israel was saved? Didn't happen, did it? No. Do miracles really save anyone? No. What is the purpose for miracles in the Bible? To validate the truth of the word of God. It's believing in the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Yeah. Go to Acts chapter 9. This is the uh, fashion show. Chapter 9, verse 36, at Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas, which means gazelle, beautiful doe. <laughs> this woman was full of good works, charitable deeds, which she did. And it happened in those days that she became sick and she died. And when they washed her and they laid her in the upper room, and since Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter was there and they sent two men to him imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose, and he went with them. And when he came, they brought him into the upper room. And all of the widows showed, stood by him, weeping and showing the tunics and the garments which Dorcas had made while she was still with them. That's why I said it was a fashion show. <laughs> but Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and she saw Peter and sat up. And then he gave his hand her and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive, and it became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed on the Lord. And so it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon the Tanner. The validation of the proof, the truth claims that Jesus makes with regard to himself. Now, now one of his disciples, after his decease, after his resurrection, performs this miracle. We said the next one was with whom? Yes, the Apostle Paul, raising Eutychus. Turn to me to Acts 20. Paul is ministering there at Troas. Now, when the first verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 7. Everybody there? Now, on the first day of the week, what day is that? Sunday. Sunday. On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break, why did they come together on a Sunday? It's the Lord's Day. When did it become the Lord's Day? After his resurrection, right. That's why we gather, on, you know, Seventh Day Adventist says you need to gather on the Sabbath, which is Saturday. No, 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 no. Why did the early church always gather on the first day of the week? Because they're commemorating, memorializing his resurrection. Every time we gather together, as we are this morning, this is a mini celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are praising him and thanking him and showing our hope and our faith and trust in the fact that one day we will be raised from the dead. Or the fact may be we may never die. We may be the generation that is translated. Hmm? Nonetheless, First day of the week, and the disciples came together to break bread. Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke with them and continued with his message until midnight. What do you think? Should we stay? We have no bathroom facilities. That's the only thing that's hindering us this morning. <laughs> there were many lamps in the upper room there where they were gathered together. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. 
He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. I wonder sometimes when I'm speaking, I see some people sleeping, I wonder if they are dead or alive. I remember one time, there's a young man I've known since he was a little guy. He's right here, and I'm speaking on a Sunday morning. And, and I don't know what he was doing Saturday night, but he was out cold. And so as I was speaking, I went down sat down next to him. And I'm still talking, still teaching, and everybody's laughing, and he's still, he's out. And then I just gave him an elbow and said, how's the message? <laughs> I think I rose him from the dead. <laughs> you should have seen his reaction. <laughs> But Paul went down, fell upon him, and embraced him, verse 10 now, and said, Do not trouble yourself, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up, he had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while. Even till daybreak he departed, and they brought the young man in alive, and they were all not a little comforted. Wow, what a blessing that had to be. Hmm? But as I said, the goat of the resurrection, the greatest of all time, right, was whose? The resurrection of Christ from the dead. The resurrection of Christ from the dead. Now, the point being, uh, another moment, just give me another minute. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Wisest man that ever lived. Who was that? Solomon. Solomon. Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes, he's giving us a proper perspective on when we experience the sting of death or when we go to a funeral. In chapter 7, in verse 1, Ecclesiastes, everybody there? I'll wait till you get there. Take a drink. A good name, better than precious ointment. And the day of death than the day of one's birth. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses use this text to say that you should never celebrate your birthday. That's ridiculous. Of course we want to celebrate a birthday. You have to be born once in order to be born twice, twice right? <laughs> in order to be born again, you have to be born the first time. But here, nonetheless, what Solomon is saying is that, is that if you are a believer, the day of one's death is the day that ends our sojourning, our pilgrimage through this world. When Jacob met Pharaoh and Pharaoh was questioning him about his life, what did Jacob tell him? My days have been few and full of trouble. Boy, can that not describe a lot of what we experience in life? It's true. And, and time just seems to fly by now, doesn't it? I think there's something in the physics, Mark, as we get older. Time just goes faster. I don't understand it. You know. Better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. And what Solomon is saying here is it's far better you go to a funeral than a party. What are you going to contemplate in a party? Anybody can go through good times together, can't they? It's when you go through the sufferings and the trials, the afflictions and the sufferings of this life that you really begin to muse deeply on what's important. Considering your mortality. We live in a culture and a society that is in denial of death. Let me give you the statistics. Far worse than COVID. Right? What's the, what's the death rate in COVID? 0.4%. Well, let me give you the statistic of death, 100%. 100 out of 100, 1,000 out of 1,000, a million out of a million. Everyone hearing me this morning, everyone in the sanctuary, everyone over the Internet, we are going to die unless the Lord returns and brings about the rapture. I'm, I'm banking on it, you know, <laughs> I'm praying. But nonetheless, better to go to the house of mourning, the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men. For it has been destined, as Hebrews declares, once to die and then? The then the judgment. Whether you're in denial of God's existence or whether you're a worshiper and a lover of God, you will be under God's rule, subject to his judgment. And the living will take it to heart. How did Jesus describe those who were unbelievers during his day when he was speaking with his disciples and the Sadducees and the Pharisees were passing by? They are... Yeah, and that's what John the Baptist said. Jesus said they are dead while they yet... So who are the living as far as Jesus is concerned? Those who believe. And the living, take it to heart. 
Those of us who believe. Sorrow is better than laughter, for a sad countenance is better. Is a, is a sad countenance, the heart is made better. The heart of the wives is in the house of mourning. The heart of fools is in the house of Mary. Mm. What is he saying here? When you experience the death of those that we love, of our friends, when we go to a funeral, we need to muse deeply on the meaning of life. Today, most religious services, funerals, whatever, everybody wants to be amused. They want to be entertained. They don't want to be forced to think deeply about their own lives, about what may take place, about at the end of the matter when God judges, either before the bema seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment. You know, we, we as believers, we will go through the bema seat of Christ. But there is therefore no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, but it is a fearful thing to go before Christ at the bema seat. Why? What is the Bema seat? Everything we did wrong will be exposed. It's, it's the judgment. It's the judgment seat of, a, of an athletic competition where you won't be punished for not winning, but you receive rewards for what we have done well. Now, we want to have something, right? But all we'll be able to say in return is, Lord, I only did that which you had commanded me to do and only did that which you enabled me to do for it is you who worked within me both to will because I was not willing, that not desire and, and was able to do, right? Both work to will and to do. He gives us the desire, he gives us the ability and then he rewards us for the same. It don't get any better than that, does it? Huh? <laughs> Go with me to Philippians chapter one. Let's see Paul's attitude towards death. As a believer, what our attitude should be. And there's way too much fear today. Truly, be prudent, take the right cautions, precautions, actions that are necessary. I don't want to leave here prematurely. I don't want to leave here one more moment than I'm supposed to, but I want to be honest with you. I don't want to be here one more moment than I need to be. What I understand, the little bit that I understand of heaven and what awaits me, I can't wait to get there. That was Paul's attitude. Now, now, Paul had an advantage. Why did he have an advantage over us? He'd been there. Paul was caught up to the third heaven. And he said, it is so wonderful. It is so amazing. It is so marvelous. What's the buzzword today? Awesome! That it would be criminal for me to do what? To try to describe it to you. Paul said it'd be criminal for me to even try to describe heaven. Paul, you could have tried, Right? But what I do know, oh, I can't wait. But look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supplication of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether in by life or either way. Paul said, hey, either way, either way, God is going to be glorified. I want God to be glorified in the way I live, and I want God to be glorified in the way I die. The only person that was here when my dear wife passed away was Pastor David. But I have never seen anyone before or since glorify God in their dying so wonderfully. And we were a young church, uh, and, and uh, she said to me, well, God has called me to show the church how to die. That's what she said. And she surely did, didn't she, David? She lived that verse. Paul goes on to say, for, verse 21, for to me, to live Christ, for to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Literally, in the Greek text, live Christ, die gain. It's only four words. Live Christ, die again. If we're living, allowing Christ to live his life through us, that's the Christian life now. You can't do it. You, 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 the flesh will never overcome the flesh. You understand that? You can't modify and improve the flesh by the flesh. Only the spirit can overcome the flesh. And it's the spirit of Christ. We allow the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ to live his life through us. 
And that gives us evidence of the fact. Live Christ, when I die, I'll gain. Why? Because I know I'm a saved man. The evidence of my justification or my salvation is my sanctification. The way I live my life. How many times have I told you, beloved, don't listen with your ears, what people tell you. Listen with your eyes. People live what they believe. And there's far too few people living a life for Christ and his glory who claim to be Christian. Is that not true? Yeah. Yeah. For to me, live Christ to die gain, but verse 22. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean my fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. He, he was conflicted. He wanted to go home and be with the Lord, but yet he knew the Lord was using him here. For if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I choose, I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is what? What? Death is what? Death is what? Far better. It's gain. It's far better. Hey, do you believe that? When I die, don't cry for me. I, I've told the church, listen, if I have a heart attack and you revive me, you're getting a knuckle sandwich. <laughs> and, and, well, however God wants to choose to take me, I'm ready. That's my blessed hope, my promise. I have no fear in death. But I want to glorify him in life. For I'm hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far, far better, far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, that I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for the progress of the joy of your faith. Wow. Wow. Paul would write later, last text, 1 Corinthians 15. Death part of the natural process of life? No, God never intended it. God never intended it. Death was brought about as a result of sin. Go all the way back to the beginning of our conversation. In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely. And then they were prevented from eating from the... But it is the tree of life, the true tree of life, the cross of Christ that now has overcome the sting of death. And one day, one day we are going to be privileged to see what? The death of death. What a day. You know, those of you who have been stung by it, you know, I can't wait to rejoice over. Don't you love those? I love cowboy flicks. So I don't know about you, westerns. You know, but I like westerns where the bad guy always gets what he deserves. You know? Uh, you know. I watch the end of it. Yeah, yeah, she and Miguel. I watch a girly flick for Gail. You know. Hey, you want to watch a good movie? What's it called? Dream Horse. True story. Dream Wonderful. Yeah dream, horse. yeah, dream Horse. But anyway, Side note. <laughs> death. And the sting of death. And the pain of death. One day, we're going to see. Boom, it destroyed. And what a hallelujah that's going to be. Look at me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now I say this to you. But chapter 15 of second of 1 Corinthians. Verse 50. Are you there? 1 Corinthians 15. 50. We there? Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. It's not flesh and blood, it's flesh and bone that we'll have, right? We're blood-born now, but then we'll be spirit-driven, spirit-born. I could prove that later, but another, another time. Verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we'll not all die, but we'll all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Hallelujah! Today, Lord, my neighbor uh, up the road, we love him, Bill. He's a wonderful believer, he and his wife, and he has cancer. But every time we see him, we say, Bill, assume the position. Because <laughs> we talk about the Lord coming. And I said, Bill, you better not precede me. We better go together. I'll be jealous. <laughs> Did he? Sweet, sweet. Yeah, they're your neighbors too, right? <laughs> sweet people. 
In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption, this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? For the sting of death is sin, and the sin of and the strength of sin is in the law. We are going to see the death of death. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So death from a biblical perspective for the believer is our friend and not our foe, isn't it? And and Jesus likens death of the believer to sleep. Isn't it wonderful when you get a good night's rest? Good night's sleep? Yeah. Now, now listen to me. Stop allowing this world, the enemy, and the unbeliever to put you in fear over that which we have no fear of. Be prudent. You know all of the things that are being said today and, and what's a conspiracy theory and what isn't where the truth lies. What, you know, which of us really know? But I do know this. Whether I live or whether I die, it'll be for the glory of God. And when I die... When I exit here for the last time, I will truly be living life as God intended it to be. The curse will be lifted, and there'll be no more sting of death. And I will experience what it really means to embrace the tree of life, the cross of my Jesus Christ. Is that not true? Live fearlessly, beloved. Fearlessly. Because the only thing the enemy can do over the people of God is put them into an unrealistic fear. Amen? Amen? Yeah, shall we stand? Pastor Dave, you got a closing song?